Thank you, Ian. Uh, good morning, and thank you uh, for everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's been a difficult week for the people who depend on Metro in the region, for sure. And I want to begin by acknowledging the challenges our customers are experiencing. Uh, please know we are working to restore full service on the system as quickly as possible, uh, but we'll only do so when it is safe to do so. I also want to publicly recognize our employees who have been dedicated to problem solving, logistics planning, maintenance, cleaning, customer care, policing, and operating our trains and buses over the last week and through the entire pandemic. <clears throat> Today, I want to update you on our schedule for October 25th through the 31st, discuss our work to restore normal passenger service and answer any questions about service. Um, as Ian mentioned, I am unable to answer any questions related to the Blue Line derailment investigation due to NTSB rules. First, we will continue our current service schedule through, uh, through Sunday, October 31st, with trains departing about every 15 to 20 minutes on the red line and every 20 to 30 minutes on all other lines. I also want to encourage customers to utilize Metro bus, <coughs> bus routes as an alternative where it makes sense for them. I also wanna thank our local partners that we've been working with to improve bus service and connections with the rail line as well with their services. So thank them. Meanwhile, we know many riders are still using the rail system. And I appreciate the 186,000 riders on average each day during the last week. Up front, I do wanna say that we don't yet have a timetable for placing the 7,000 series rail cars back in passenger service but I can share where we are headed. We continue to work with our safety partners in Kawasaki to inspect every wheel on the 7,000 series rail cars. To return these cars to passenger service, we're focused on four key elements. First, inspection frequency. We were inspecting on the industry standard 90 day intervals and using new data, we will determine how often to check wheel alignments. Second is testing. New inspection protocols must be proven through pilot testing. So that will take some time to do that as well. Car isolation. We're developing an enhanced process and mechanism to ensure that only cars that pass inspection are ready to return to service or return to service. And then finally, remobilization. With more, with more than half of our fleet in storage, we need to, to create a logistic plan to put the equipment back in the right location and then to put it through the new inspection process while operating the passenger service. So before I take any questions, let me reiterate that none of this speaks to the root cause of the derailment, which again remains the under investigation by the NTSB. At this time, I'll stop here and take any service related questions and the chairman will take any questions regarding any board actions. Okay. I'm yeah, I was going to say, if you could raise your hand, I see um, uh, William Ford, do you want to go first? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, you had mentioned about the customers, uh, Mr. Wiedefeld, and with this update with the, the derailment that happened, could you summarize uh, how do you continue to keep customers where some of them may just decide, you know what, I don't feel like returning no more. Summarize that, please. Thank you. Sure. I, I think um, it, with the service reduced as it is, I understand, you know, it's very difficult for people to use the system. But I think what's key to remember, the reason it's being reduced is from a safety perspective. And I think what we've shown in the past is as we address safety issues, people are, that's their most, that, that is one of the biggest concerns. And as we do that, they'll come back. Uh, Justin George. Paul, uh, the, the inspection and the process to get the 6,000 trains back into service has taken 10 months. Can we you know, surmise that with the 7,000 series, a much larger fleet, that that could provide any sort of like timeline or can you say that um, things can move much quicker than that? Uh, I would not use that as, as the analogy. Uh, that was a totally different, that was a coupling issue where we had to go buy equipment and things of that sort. Um, I think it's too early to give a timeline. Again, with the timeline is going to be driven by safety. And as soon as it is safe, we will put it back out there. Uh, Adam, Adam Tassifiron. Yeah, good morning. Thanks for holding this briefing, giving us an update. Paul, what can you do 
uh, in the short term to ease riders' frustrations. Uh, you know, there was some talk about bringing back some of the older rail cars or possibly fixing the sixes as fast as you can and get them out there. There was talk about expanding bus service. I know that you're pretty much at capacity, but what else can you do for these people who now are waiting 30 to 40 minutes, sometimes just to go one stop? Uh, what, what can you do for them? Yeah, what we are doing, Adam, is we are uh, the 2000s and the 3000 series, as you know, some of our oldest cars, which basically we were not putting in service. We are bringing them back into service. They have to go through protocols to do that. The six, the 6000 series, we are again, we're, we're putting as much manpower there to get those uh, to the to the standard that they need to be to run the service. So we will put those out as quickly as we can. Again, once we meet safety protocols on those vehicles as well. Uh, as you know, we are operating, we were operating almost over 90% of our pre-pandemic service and have been moving, again, before the derailment, roughly 30% of the traffic. So we've had enough, a lot of capacity out there. Same way with the bus. So you mentioned the bus. We are looking at ways maybe we can tweak that, but we're providing 97% of pre-pandemic service uh, with that. So then it becomes an issue of you only have so many operators. So we're going to you know, it, adjust those where we can. And again, I think that's working with the local governments, other opportunities to improve that service as well, to give people another alternative to just rail. And Paul, if I can just add on uh, one quick question here, you know, forget about the derailment and I'm not asking any questions about it, but there is a question about whether or not the right decisions are being made at Metro, whether or not safe decisions are being made. How can you tell people that safe decisions are being made when people are quite literally, you know, taking your word for it, that you're going to be putting safe service out there? I think um, we have a history of that, Adam, uh, that, you know, we have shown, I think, repeatedly that that is what we do. And when we find an issue, we get to the root cause of it and we solve it and we move on. Uh, I think we have a track record of doing that and we will continue to do that. Um, and I, I, again, like, like everyone else, that system has to be safe before we can run it. And that's, I use it, you know, as you know, on a regular basis, my family uses it and that's the way I view it. And that's the way I, all of our employees view it. Uh, Ashraf with the Associated Press. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having this briefing. Um, I just wanted to confirm uh, the details of what you said earlier that the, at this point we have no timetable for the return of the 7,000 series cars and it will be limited service through at least October 31st? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, I guess just as a follow-up, um, are there any steps you can take to address kind of consumer confidence in the metro system going forward? I, I think the actions we're taking addresses that. The fact that we pulled down the, pulled down the fleet because we have an issue, the fact that we're working with the manufacturer and other safety entities to find out what the issues are here and to solve them is the way to basically build the confidence back. Um, and that's what we will continue to do. Hey, uh, Tom Rousey. Uh, hey, Paul. Um, thanks for having this. Um, broader question, because I know you can't talk specifically about the investigation, but you were just asked about restoring confidence and trust. And there's a lot of folks I've talked to outside of Metro who are upset. They didn't know this was even a looming issue. Like, how can you how can we know in the future there's not some safety issue that we don't know about that can potentially lead to something like a derailment? How um, how can you give people confidence that you're not it, for lack of a better word, hiding anything from them that's going on. Yeah. Uh, hey, I don't, I, we have, we're not hiding anything. We want to be transparent as possible, and, and we will be and are. And when we see issues, that's unfortunately, it does, I understand that erode some confidence. But the, the fact is, you bring things forward when you have problems, and you say, this is a problem I have, and we're going to fix it. Um, and I, I understand some people will view that as, well, wait a minute, that, that, that reduces the confidence. But, you know, you look at other industries, uh, you know, there are things that happen the same in aviation and in, in, in automobiles. You recognize them, you deal with them, and you move on. Um, that's what we have to do. And as far as the service, you said at least through October 31st, uh, realistically, can you give people any sort of timeline from when they'll see at least some improvement? Like after the 31st, will you have enough of the older trains back to at least reduce the wait times? Can, can you give people any, that, any it, generic timeline who are sure, suffering right now? Sure, Tom. That, no, that's exactly what we're trying to do is get as many of the rest of the fleet out there, which will do that. 
Um, and at minimum, what it does is if there's any issue with a car or say someone gets sick on a, on a, on a train, you can bring in other cars basically to, to deal with those types of issues. You know, so you have a sort of a little bit of redundancy. So that's the first thing that we're trying to do. So we'll continue to focus on that. Um, but obviously the real key is getting a new inspection program that everyone feels comfortable with, that it is safe, and then we'll get those cars out as quick, quickly as we can. Hey, Dad, you have Oh, sorry. How many do you have in storage if you combine 6,000, 2,000, 3,000? I'll have Ian give you the exact numbers just so you have those. Great. Uh, JC, do you have a question? Uh, hi there. Yes, good morning. Uh, thanks, Paul, for hosting this again. I uh, wanted to ask you, kind of in light of what we saw this week and the sort of evolving way that Metro uh, handled the, the lack of trains on the tracks, were there any efficiencies that you learned this week that will help hopefully make next week a bit easier? Uh, I, I, I know we have, actually. I mean, just from an operational standpoint, um, just, uh, just a little bit of inside baseball. I mean, when you have this fleet, um, it's all intermingled. <laughs> literally in yards, if you, I, I know that you, a number of you have seen some of our yards. So we're literally just jockeying cars around and getting them in position, getting them to the right yards so that you have them at the different locations at the endpoints. That took some time um, because, so we'll get more efficient with that. Obviously we ha already have, but when you when you made this major shift of how you're operating, there were definitely some hiccups along the way that we'll, we will correct and get more efficient at it. Um, so that, that that's one example of it. Will that, do you think, help uh, smooth out the, the wait yes. times and the frustrations yes. next week? Okay, yeah, exactly, you. exactly. And, uh, Jordan, Jordan Pasley, you're next. Yeah, Paul, Metro told the NTSB that these issues were progressively getting worse over the recent years. And from what I can understand, uh, the board didn't know about this. WMSC didn't know about this. Why was that the case? Yeah, I think I think that's still under investigation, but uh, I do know what we were what we were doing. What we were doing is inspecting the cars every 90 days, basically as industry standard. We had done thousands upon thousands upon thousands of inspections, and a handful of them did not meet that requirement in, on a year on a year basis. So from a from a warranty perspective, is how a lot of that was being viewed. You had something that wasn't working to what was expected in the warranty. We went to Kawasaki, we get a new wheel, we put it on. So again, in, 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 in the scale of this, that's the way that that was uh, evolving. In 21, that spiked some, still thousands upon thousands of inspections, but that number went up. That is definitely where, the, you know, that should have been raised much sooner. So we'll get to the bottom of all of that, you know, but that is not my focus right now. We, there's lots of times to get to all that history and all that, and that will come out in, in the different views that are underway. The most important thing for me right now is how do I get the service back up in a safe manner for this region? That's what I am focusing on. That is my greatest focus. All that other stuff will play out and we'll get to the bottom of that and we'll deal with those issues. But that does not help that person that's standing on the platform. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. And a quick follow-up for uh, Paul Smedberg. Um, Paul, this board is completely different from, from when um, Weidefeld's contract was uh, approved three years ago. Um, do you still have faith in Metro's leadership and you know, from the top to you know, folks that maybe should have put you know, this information up the rungs a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, we have confidence in Mr. Wiedefeld as general manager, Teresa Posado as the chief safety officer. And as I was going to say in my uh, prepared remarks here, uh, written for this, that, you know, we're behind the entire team looking to get service back safely. Uh, and that, you know, we want to assure the customers and our riders and our stakeholders that we are going to get there, but we're going to do it safely. And uh, we absolutely have confidence in Paul and his uh, team working on this. Thanks. Okay, um, uh, Megan, uh, Megan Rivers. 
Hey, again, thanks for having this. Megan Rivers with Channel 9 here. I just want to talk a little bit about ridership numbers and if you guys have been keeping up with that um, since all of this has happened. Um, are you seeing a, a, a drastic decrease? More people are starting to go back into the office. Uh, so more people who rely on that transport uh, mode of transportation were using the metro. But have you seen uh, what kind of the numbers have been like since all of this has happened? Yeah, it, um, Megan has dropped some. The numbers are roughly 186,000 riders uh, on average a day over the last week, and he can get you some numbers from the previous week, so you can make that comparison. And one quick follow-up to that, too. I just want to re uh, go over the timeline again. So October 31st is, um, is going to be the limited service, um, at least till October 31st. No timetable on when you'll get back. And what are the, the alternate routes you were saying that folks are, have access to? That is where we're working with some of our bus routes, where basically if they mirror uh, closer to a line, we're, we're tweaking them some and we're working with local governments as well with their bus systems to see if there's things that we can do to give people better options on the bus side. So that is still playing out. We will get out in specific information on that. Uh, we've been meeting with them, so there, that will take some time as well, but we want to create as much uh, of uh, redundancy there as we can. But again, I think it was mentioned earlier though, you know, that service is already out there, is, you know, almost to its max. So there's going to be very little room there. Okay, thank you. Wait, uh, Ian Duncan. Uh, hi, thanks for doing this. Um, I just was wondering, Mr. Wiedefeld, in your message to your employees this week, you said that there was like some frustration that you were hearing about some of the reporting on uh, the issues. Um, is there anything that you're in a position to clarify today like specifics on what it is that you've been hearing from your staff that they're concerned about? No, I put that note out because, you know, we have an extremely proud workforce. They work very hard. And you think of what they've been through over the last 18 months. You know, these are the people that have been moving this region during this COVID and during this pandemic. And they've been under tremendous stress. And a lot of information is flying out there um, with the way the process works. That does not get, you know, there's not immediate reaction to some of that because the NTSB basically says, no, we're going to find the facts and we will put out the facts. Uh, so, you know, we're not going to comment on that, but there's just a general frustration. You know, I have almost 13,000 employees that work very hard every day to make things that are safe, to meet the needs of, of, the, of the region. And there was some of that. They're saying, you know, gosh, you know, <laughs> You know, we're working very hard and, and we're, you know, just to make sure people, and I appreciate it. I just wanted to share with them that I appreciate it. And we will we'll run this down to the to, to ground like we do with everything else and get to the bottom of it. And we will go from there. Um, but they work extremely hard. I just wanted to reinforce that. And that I'm proud uh, to be with them. And just one more, if I could. Are, are these cars still under warranty? You said that there were, some of these issues were being addressed with warranties before. Is that still an option? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it depends on the car. It depends on uh, some of the um, systems in the car. So they all have maybe uh, some different warranties. So it would be, you know, specific. But in the case of the wheels, they were, they were under warranty and they were being, being replaced. Of any ones that we found that were out of tolerance, they were being replaced. Thanks. All right, we have a few more minutes. Um, uh, Rick Massimo, if you're on. No, we can come back to him. Um, uh, going back in just in, in order, uh, I see uh, uh, Tom you first. Do you have a quick follow up, Tom? I, I had a question for Paul Smedberg. Um, I just wanted to ask about the outside safety consultants. It, it seems like you're kind of saying we don't believe we can get the full picture from just Metro anymore, but I want you to put that in your own words, if you would, why you felt it was important to hire outside safety consultants for the board. Yeah, Tom, we currently don't have anyone on the board that is a safety expert per se, or people that are familiar with how that uh, operation works. We have had people like that on the board in the past. So we wanted to make sure that we have advisors as we work through this with the general manager and Ms. Emposado, that we have people on board that can help us analyze the information make sure we have the right information, make sure we're asking the right questions and possibly, you know, 
as as this comes to a conclusion that uh you know maybe there are things that we the board and we together with the general manager can do better uh you know into the future because as you know one of our primary goals is safety oversight or, or prior, uh, responsibilities is safety oversight so you know we got to make sure we get this right uh so we you know we we wanted to have that you know independent third party just guide us through this process and do you feel the board should have been informed about this issue with the wheels uh, you know, we had no knowledge of this at this point, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, what we're seeing, there was, you know, this slight uptick, uh, this coming year, it, you know, I, I think we're going to reserve judgment on that right now, but, uh, to see, you know, with all the facts, you know, as they come out, but, uh, you know, I do know that, you know, the board in, in, you know, in general has, does have some concerns that if we, you know, did see this uptick that, you know, we weren't informed, but. Uh, you know, again, we'll move on together with the general manager and make sure that, uh, you know, in the future that, uh, you know, things like this don't happen again. Okay, we got time for just uh, one more question. Um, I see, um, uh, sorry, I was trying to go in order. Um, uh, Adam, uh, do you have one final question? Yeah, Paul, is it possible, and I'm not talking about the derailment, but is it possible that the 7,000s for years potentially could have been derailing and then re-railing themselves? Please talk about that and then talk about, you know, where you believe the state of safety and the safety culture is with Metro. I think um, the every year, every 90 days, we were inspecting these, these wheels and we're not finding issues in literally uh, very, very small. Um, sample uh, that we did find them. The vast majority don't have them. So that's, you know, that's the standard that the industry follows. Obviously, something else is going on here that we're all trying to track down. We'll get to that. In terms of the overall safety culture, I don't believe this at this point is, is a safety culture, cultural issue, that, that it was more a mechanical issue that mechanics are looking at and the way that they view things in terms of a warranty and in terms of dealing with their manufacturer. Um, so I, I feel very strongly. I know that um, we work very closely with our union, uh, of all of our unions, uh, but over the last few years to build that, that culture, um, we've seen it play out. Uh, we've seen it play out during the uh, pandemic uh, where, where people have stepped up and taken the next step on safety and culture or on safety. Uh, so I, I feel very strong that we continue in that, in that direction. Um, it's not a, a point where you say, okay, we're there and we're done but it's something that we've continued to improve and will continue to improve. Great, everyone, um, at this time, I want to uh, just uh, see if uh, Mr. Ritterfeld or Mr. Snedberg has any uh, final comments. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, if, if I could, I, I just had a brief statement. So I, I just wanna reiterate and state that, you know, I do have confidence in the general manager and the chief safety officer to work through this in a good way and work cooperatively, not only with the uh, people investigating this uh, uh, incident, but also, uh, you know, working with the employees and the board, uh, you know, to move forward in a good, uh, con you know, constructive way to, to get at the heart of this. Um, and I also want to ensure our riders and our stakeholders that we're going to work through this uh we're gonna we're gonna get there uh hopefully bring back service as quickly as possible um but doing so safely um and i think we are the board is certainly committed to that i know mr wiedefeld uh, and his team is committed to that so uh that is one thing i want to make clear with folks we are going to get there and we are going to do it safely thank you all right, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, for everyone that was uh, uh, listening earlier, I just wanted to have um, give you an updated number for the average ridership this week. Um, it's about um, 157,000. Um, and you can feel free to reach out to me if you um, need a um, more specific breakdown. Um, thank you, everyone, very much. For the TV folks, if you weren't recording, um, I will shoot you a, um, a link to download the video shortly. And as always, just email me with any uh, follow up questions you have. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.